And I remember as a student, when that book was there, thinking what a change in, in perspective compared to Bjorken and Drell and all the really old books. So. Uh, yeah, it's good that you reminded me. I forgot yeah. to say anything about it. I also <laughs> took lectures from the Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to tell you about qubits in space, and it's not because they're interesting. So it's uh, I'm, I'm going to it's face value. I'm going to show you that there, there are old calculations of unruh detectors which are wrong in in some sense. Uh, they're not wrong in, in another sense. But I'm really going to uh, tell you this because uh, I have an agenda, and I, I, I want to show you a qubit calculation as a simplest possible example of an explicit calculation of how to resum late time effects in perturbation theory. Because uh, that's kind of a generic problem that we have in, 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 in cosmology and in, in, in many places in physics. But in just in general, in gravitational physics, there's a, uh, as I'm going to argue in a second, there's a, um, an issue with how, you know, can you make reliable predictions given that all the calculations, all the inferences we're drawing are perturbative. Most of the things that we do when we talk about black holes or cosmology are based largely on non-interacting or very weakly interacting fields on a gravitational background. And when we make late time assumptions or statements about their late time behavior, inferences that are implicitly based on saying that the interactions that could have been there could have been perturbed in. And so there was possible to make late time predictions uh, in perturbation theory. And there's a well known problem with that in other areas of physics. So the way I'm going to tell you the story is there's going to be kind of a long motivation part, which will be kind of the background program that uh, I and many have been on uh, to try and quantify how this works in cosmology and, and, and there's less work done, but also in black holes. And then I'm going to switch to the qubits in uh, the sitter space, or it doesn't have to be the sitter space, but uh, a qubit calculation. And the, the point of the qubit calculation will be that it, it can take you through this formalism. I want to take a formalism that is in, uh, comes from condensed matter physics and optics, and I want to argue for you that that's the right way to think about late time physics and gravitational backgrounds. And I want to use this qubit calculation as just the simplest stripped down example to see how it works in detail. And you can kind of see all the steps in a way which is extremely explicit, which is often not true in the field theory calculations. So in this meeting, you know, I'll, ta I'll talk, start with Weinberg. And so uh, there's the young Weinberg. And of course, the picture we have is that effective field theories are describing gravity. Gravity, we can do the quantum calculations for as long as we're doing them along uh, wavelengths. And, and that's all a very precise statement in the sense that um, you know, if we imagine general relativity is part of a larger derivative expansion, if we look at a process involving E external lines at some energy E a Q, then the dependence on the scales in the Lagrangian, the Planck mass, and, and whatever the scale is that suppresses the higher curvature terms, which is typically not the Planck mass, because it's the smallest mass that wins in the denominator. If you ask kind of how the answers depend on, on, on those scales, then it's a simple power counting exercise. There's, uh, this is a standard. Uh, factor of energy divided by Planck mass that count the number of loops, but then there's also things that count the number of uh, these extra, extra scales that are coming from other derivatives. But the extra suppressions all come from interactions which have more than two derivatives. I'm using n to label the, the various interactions in the problem, and d counts the number of derivatives in those interactions. And so the Einstein term is equals two, and so is not in that series. And so it shows you that all the two derivative interactions are, are kind of not really costing you anything. It makes sense to work nonlinearly in the Einstein equations, uh, Einstein uh, equations, but uh, at the same time suppress all these higher derivative things. And there's a similar story for cosmology. You add some more fields. There's a or actually, before I say that, I should say that uh, the message here is the semi-classical expansion is a low energy expansion. And of course, it behooves us all to make sure that we're doing it right. And then, uh, you know, the, it's not just a leading order statement. There's order by order. You have the statement of, of, of what, what appears. The leading thing was L equals zero, and you choose nothing involving higher derivatives. The next leading one is you let L equals one, or take L equals zero and insert exactly once a curvature squared term, and that's the uh, counter terms for the loop divergences you had in the first uh, case. Uh, cosmology is a similar story. You add another field, but it's otherwise qualitatively similar, although there's one new feature that comes in. Uh, uh, amongst the new features that come in is this one, that the interactions that involve no derivatives uh, punish you at low energies in the same way that the uh, higher derivative ones uh, rewarded you at low energies. And so there's potentially a problem at low energies, and this is kind of one way of slicing the naturalist story. 
Uh, there's a threat to the low energy perturbative expansion, but you get away with it in cosmology because the scale, uh, so H is the small scale here, and, it's, and, the, and the worrisome thing is it's in the denominator. But the other scales here are V, the scale coming from the potential, and then in Planck, and then what you get away with it if it happens to be true that you choose V to be small, and then H is the thing that you get from the Friedman equation, which is if it turns out to be, if, if you're in a situation where H squared is V to the fourth over M Planck squared, which it typically is in simple models, then this factor, although it could have been dangerous, isn't dangerous because we're choosing special interactions when we do cosmological models, basically. All right, so. So, makes it, so that's this party line, and we all believe it, that, the, that there's a low energy story going on. And, but there's also things that, that make us worry about that story. Some of them are coming from cosmology, where people calculate perturbatively the corrections to uh, inflationary uh, predictions, let's say, in, in, in models with two or more scalar fields, and find these phenomena of secular growth and infrared problems. There's a whole infrared story, or the infrared loss story for black holes, which is, again, a late time story when you're looking at very, very late times when you, a lot of the information has come out of the black hole. There's things that s smell funny about the uh, predictions one makes with gravity at the quantum level at late times, and the question is, is, there, is, that, is that a sign of a breakdown uh, in the semi-classical approximations that we believe control things? And so, is the domain of validity of, uh, of uh, quantum gravity, is it sufficient to have uh, the energy be small, or is there additional criterion to also worry about, and I'm going to argue that there are additional criteria at, at, at late times. That uh, although it's true that low energies gives you a semi-classical expansion that's under control for gravity, specifically when you make late time uh, inferences in perturbation theory like that, uh, there's additional things you have to uh, try and uh, take care of. And so uh, the good news, though, is that um, so the, the the things that I'm going to are going to you're going to see the. The thing to have in mind as a, as, a, as a mental model of what's going on is, is a, a, not so much a Wilsonian action, but to think of a, that the quantum mechanics in the gravitational field is much more like a particle in a medium, in the sense that you've got an environment that's just sitting there and you're interacting with it for long, uh, uh, all the time, and so small things can accumulate over late times. And so the language I'm going to try and uh, pirate is the language of how you deal with open systems and media. And that, that's the good news. Is that these tools have been developed over decades and other areas. They've been well tested. And so I think we're crazy not to use them because I think that they're the right tools to think about these long time problems. And you have a lot of intuition for them because uh, the, the you know, simplest example, particle and medium that we all know and love is light and, gl and glass. And you know that if you're ever in a regime where all the light's coming in here and it all either goes down or it goes up and none of it goes straight forward, perturbation is a shitty description of that because. Uh, Perturbation theory, everything goes straight forward and then a little bit happens around the edges. And so you know that this optic situation that we know and love is, is a regime where perturbation theory has failed. And, and what's going on there is that any one photon was interacting weakly with any one atom, but you go by 50 billion atoms and you've hit one. And so then, then you, you start to get these coherent effects that drive you down and drive you up. <coughs> but the good news is that uh, you know, the, the breakdown of perturbation theory that's happening is not a mystery. You know, Evolution is e to the h t, and the message there is that no matter how small your, your interaction h is, there's a t that will get you eventually, and that's where the danger is. But the good news is, uh, you know, we're not at a loss as to how to handle geometric optics. You know, you can say an awful lot about how to calculate the properties of materials, and we don't have to solve QED as an exact problem. And so it's, uh, those are the tools that I want to apply to this qubit example to see how they, they, they work. And so where they come from is a, in a general framework of uh, what would be called uh, you know, open quantum systems. And I want to phrase them as open effective field theories because there's a hierarchy of scales argument that's going on here, very much like the ones that we're used to for Wilsonian actions. But they differ in detail from the Wilsonian you know, uh, mechanics of how you put together a Wilsonian effective power counting. So the basic picture is you've got Hubert space. There's a lot of stuff you're never going to measure. Call that sector B. There's some specific sector you're going to do all your measurements in called sector A. And it's just a fact that if you want to know, uh, as a function of time, the outcome of all your measurements that are restricted to sector A, it's to know how the reduced density matrix evolves as a function of time. So you take the full density matrix for the whole thing, trace out B. If you can figure that out at all times, you can figure out the time evolution of all your observables in sector A. That's, that's the problem you're trying to solve. It's define rho A of T. And you're doing it 
knowing that there's a Liouville equation giving you the evolution in the full theory. And so the question is, how do you extract time evolution information for the reduced density matrix, rho sub a, by appropriately taking traces of this uh, Liouville equation? <coughs> now, there's, there's um, the main message is going to be that uh, there's a class of different kinds of arguments which all fall under one category, which I'm going to try and uh, give you a cartoon of, uh, as to how you make late time predictions when, in, in this kind of a system, even though there's a generic problem with perturbing, uh, working with perturbation theory at late times. And the, me and, and, and the simplifications will, that will happen, if they happen, will happen if there's a typical time scale in the bath B for which you can, uh, cr you know, the cor correlations of, of this interaction Hamiltonian with itself are starting to fall off to zero. So think of it, if you think of the thermal bath, some time long compared to the scattering time where all the correlations are being washed out. In that situation, it's often true that you can take the trace of this equation and, and massage it into an expression which is a function of, again, rho a, the reduced density matrix, and not the density matrix here. The density matrix here will appear through a bunch of correlation functions of this h, and it's the properties of those correlation functions which will define the time scale with, 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 which, with respect to which you want to be looking at long times. What I'm telling you uh, in the next few slides is, is that, you know, there are books written on it. It's stuff which is, uh, it's not, uh, for other areas, it's not new. And amongst the books written on it is a new one, which you should all go out and buy, and, uh, and it's a stocking stuffer. Your mother will want to have a copy, so go get one. Just go away. All right, so what's the cartoon of the argument that the, um, of how you make late time predictions? The simplest example is the one that we all know is, is, is exponential decay laws. So, so, you know, you do a calculation of uh, some particle decay, you find, what you actually calculate is that the number of particles is, is goes, it goes down, there's a transition probability which grows linearly with time, and you identify the coefficient of that to be some rate. Normally it's some perturbatively small thing in, in your interactions. But what we believe is that that's giving us some sort of an exponential decay law, and we you know, measure that. that to, it's not true that, the, uh, that we only trust this kind of behavior, uh, that this, this exponential for a decay time. We really believe it, it works for many decay times. And the argument that, if you kind of formalize the argument that we used to uh, make that inference as to that, that this really was pointing to this, is, what, is the one that's the, basically the same argument that everybody's using in all these other examples, and it's a renormalization group argument in the end of the day. <coughs> so the idea is, we have other information in this case. In this case, we know that the decays are related to one another. So there's, there's a general argument that says that the rate of change in the number of particles should be proportional to the number of particles, and this, we believe, is more robust than perturbation theory. And what we do is we use this calculation to give us this equation, and we read off the coefficient gamma in perturbation theory. But we're not relying on perturbation theory to justify this equation. But we're calculating this equation in this way in a series of overlapping time domains. And because this equation makes no reference to time, it just all you need to know is n and gamma, and that gamma doesn't depend on time, then if those two things are true, if you can figure out the rate of change of n in a way that's a function only of n and things that don't depend on time explicitly, the inference you make about that, uh, that rate in every one of these patches uh, applies to the union of all the patches. And so the solution to this equation, you can trust for the whole union of this, of this set. And what you're doing essentially is you're, you're, you're doing a, getting all orders in g squared t. You're not getting higher powers of g that are not accompanied by t when you do that resummation. It's a renormalization group argument because it's the analog of, if you calculate the, the, you know, the, 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 the change in a cut down constant and you find that alpha goes to alpha squared log mu, you derive something in perturbation theory, but then you differentiate that to get the rate of change of alpha, and you, when you integrate that renormalization group equation, trust its domain of validity more than the original calculation that gave it to you. So it's the same spirit of the argument that you normally use in renormalization. Yeah. Yes. If the light of the neutral were of the order of the QCD time, then right. it would not make sense. Right, right, right. You can make this. The, the, the separation of scales will be. Right, right. We did a separation there will be a separation of scales, and you'll see that, uh, how that comes in in the story I'm going to tell you. But uh, so what you're saying is exactly right. And so the, the, the thing you're looking for are two things. You're looking for a hier hierarchical argument that says, and that'll, that'll be normally come in in the examples I'm going to show you. That'll be the thing that will go into deriving that kind of a formula in a way which is not some convolution over time. But then you want to have 
thinking which is not referring to time so that you can, you can kind of try to integrate things to get late times. All right. So in the kind of inflation, I'm, I'm just here I'm just going to have a couple slides just kind of uh, pointing to uh, you know, the literature which is uh, talking about this kind of tools applied to cosmology. I'm not going to talk in detail about this because I want to go to the qubit example where everything's much more explicit. But if you, t if you look at the, in cosmology, the way you, the, the cosmology has been uh, better explored than black holes. But if, in cosmology, because of all the symmetries, there's explicit calculations that have been done. And in cosmology, uh, if you take the, the, the system A to be the super Hubble modes, the ones that are the long wavelength modes, and you take B to be the ones that are Hubble scale and smaller, uh, you do that because uh, in fields in, say, the sitter space or close to the sitter space, the typical correlation time is H, or it's often H. It's not always H, but it's, uh, that's the, 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 the thing you want to be looking at long time scales compared to. And if you look at the Liouville equation for the short wavelength modes in various approximations, they, they get massaged into this form where there's a, there's a mean field kind of a piece, which is the leading contribution uh, uh, involving the interactions of the field with other, uh, maybe with itself or with, with the other modes that are being traced out. And there's often then a second order piece, which has this Lindblad form, where L is something linear in the interaction potential, and there's other than there can, can, be, can be corrections. But the point of this kind of a derivation is that once you get something in this form, it has the form, if you can make this H interaction and L not explicitly refer to uh, um, you know, time or to the variable that, would, that, that uh, would be different in, in all these different time patches, then you have a hope of integrating this equation to late times and seeing what happens. And, and a special case of this is the Serebinsky uh, stochastic story. So to, in the stochastic story, all this stuff is overkill. All you needed was the, the mean field evolution, basically. You to, often it's just a free evolution. You're just looking at the modes evolving in the presence of a, of a background space time. And then if you focus on the diagonal part of this density matrix, so you're looking at some probability distribution, and then you do the things that Leonardo was talking about, uh, where you, you neglect derivatives on the scales of the Hubble patch, then this whole story boils down to a, a Fokker-Planck equation for this probability distribution. And, and if you were asking what's controlling that approximation physically, the basic story is that uh, it's not in general true. You know, you, if you have a free theory, you, if you, you, you've got some sort of evolution for the field. And it's not in general true that a Schrodinger evolution is the same as a stochastic evolution, but it is true in the WKB limit. The kind of thing that a stochastic evolution will not get right uh, is it, it will always tell you that the average of x times p is the same as the average of p times x, because it doesn't know that they don't commute. But if you're in a WKB limit where the momentum is essentially a function of x, you know, up to corrections which are the uh, powers of the small parameter that's controlling the WKB limit, then uh, it is true that the leading piece, uh, they do commute, and then the stochastic story catches the physics of the first Schrodinger evolution, and then you can match the rate of change of the variance and the rate of change of the mean onto the, what the full evolution is doing, and you can kind of read off these terms that uh, are in Starobinsky's story. But you can do it order by order in all the parameters in your problem, and you're not limited to the massless expression that Starobinsky uh, originally came up with. You can get all the corrections uh, order by order in those small things. But you can go beyond that. You don't have to stop there. Self-interactions will come in sometimes here and sometimes here. Uh, the same story contains the decoherence story, that if you look at the off-diagonal elements of the density matrix, they, they will often be driven to zero. But th that happens first because of these interactions. And in the case of, uh, of uh, the sitter space, that happens very rapidly, it turns out, that the, on several Hubble times, there's a dramatic uh, decoherence. The diagonalization, this matrix wants to diagonalize in, in field space. So it wants the pointer basis in the language for decoherence is naturally, in, in inflationary situations, the field basis because uh, once you go outside the Hubble scale, momenta are essentially in the WK approximation are functions of position. And what normally happens is that when you decohere, you're, you decohere in a basis which diagonalizes the interactions. But because everything is becoming a function of the fields, the fields are the basis that diagonalize the interactions generically. So there's a very nice story there about how uh, that, that's related to the stochastic story, but different detail. Yeah, but what happens is, is that it, when you're, because the states are being squeezed as you, as you go outside the Hubble scale, that the canonical momenta become effectively functions of the canonical position because it's very much like a WKB thing. And, you know, it's like the WKB story where if your wave function of x is you know, e to the i s of x, you know, some small parameter, and, you know, grad psi is becoming basically grad s e to the i, you know, psi. So the eigenvalue 
momentum are turning into functions of position up to corrections that are order so, so what happens in, in, the, in the field spaces like that functional, uh, the functional momenta are becoming functions of the fields and then the uh, up to corrections that are being controlled by the how much the state is being squeezed outside the Hubble scale and then uh, that's that's what makes the field basis the one that's the favorite one that drag so all your all your interactions are functions of either the momenta or the fan the fields but that becomes functions of the fields and then so you're always diagonalized in the field basis after a few Hubble times because you have to squeeze first all right so so now that's the generality so that's that's the program but I'm kind of I've been I've been vague about the uh, how you make the get that Lindblad form from the the general Liouville equation and I want to now be explicit about that by uh, doing a qubit example so what I'm going to do is just basically the unroot detector and I can give you the same story I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you about an inertial detector in the sitter space but there's a similar story for an accelerating uh, detector in Rindler space and another one for somebody outside a black hole and they have uh, very similar characteristics so for the qubit story I just want to apply what I told you to this example to see how that uh, limit comes out so we're going to have a two-level system that's our qubit it's talking to a field take it as be a scalar field with a mass and sometimes it'll have a self interaction uh, but mostly it's not going to have that and I'll just come to back to that at the end because so sometimes you want to read some secular effects which you can do it, uh, it turns out and that's what I'll, if I do that I'll turn it on then the interaction that's going to matter so the bath will be the scalar field and it'll be in some state in the Minkowski space it's in the Minkowski vacuum and in the, uh, in, uh, the city it'll be in the bunch Davies vacuum for what I'm going to do we've got some sort of a Hamiltonian for qubit which it just says that they're split by some energy omega so that's a scale coming from the qubit sector and then there's some interaction with the field which I'll take to be linear like the under detector it's a it's the field is evaluated along the world line of the qubit and then there's some matrix which I'm going to choose to be the give me a transition between the ground state and the excited state some dimensionless coupling G that I'm going to do perfect theory in and so the things to follow so the, there's two kinds of interactions to follow but the one's more important than the other one this is the one I'm going to really do all the perturbation theory in but this one's there and I'll come back to that uh, possibly at the end if there's time to talk about how you use some uh, self-interaction effects. So now what we do is we, we just take the Liouville equation and integrate it. And so it's, uh, you know, by, in perturbation theory and powers of G. And so here's, and we're in the interaction picture. So it means that these interaction Hamiltonians are now functions of, uh, of time. We take an initial density matrix to be the vacuum in the field side of things. And we take the qubit to be something and take it to the ground state later on. And then, the, you know, this is the first few terms and there's nothing exciting there. So, uh, if I do this for the, um, you know, this system I was talking about now, it becomes this. And so, what's happened is that the, uh, these V's turned into, the, that was the thing that, that was uh, uh, acting in the, on, on the qubit side. Uh, so, this M, remember, was the, was the poly 1 matrix that gave me transitions for the qubit. And it now depends on S because, it depends on time because it's in the interaction picture. And the, all the correlation functions, when I do the trace, uh, I've done a trace here, which I didn't tell you about. So if I trace this to get the reduced density matrix to see how it evolves, that, that trace involves the field theory part and it, uh, the qubit part. And uh, I'm only tracing over the field theory part. So I, uh, what I end up getting is a bunch of correlation functions of the interaction Hamiltonian, which in this case was linear in the field, uh, in the ground state. And so I've got these correlations for these Whiteman functions, W, which is just uh, sampling the Whiteman function at different points along the trajectory. And the curly row, if I forget to tell you again, that's the reduced density matrix. I was calling it rho sub a before, but that'll be the same thing. All right, so there's a... Uh, so now, let me just remind you what in the 70s people did. This is Candelis and Shama and uh, somebody else. I forgot now. Might have been Unruh. So if we do this and we take the initial state to be uh, the ground state, and we uh, just take the, the what I showed you before and, and use the fact that the in what I showed you before, uh, if I'm not going to go to higher orders in perturbation theory, I have to use the initial state here. Things simplify for the uh, qubit. And so the, what that turns into th is this, is that there's a, all those interaction things just boil down to that integral. And then the observation that, that, that Candelis and Sharma made was that this has that standard problem that uh, these integrals, the, 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 the S1 plus S2 integral diverges because nothing depends on it. So that's the linear in time part. So they say, well, let's take the rate of change of that, we would have done for an exponential uh, uh, de decay. 
and we'll calculate the coefficient of that time, or the, we'll calculate the rate from that, and that gives us, so that differentiating this gives you this, and we'll let t get large, is, uh, you know, with the intu intuition of decays uh, in mind, I think, uh, you can imagine that uh, if things are going linearly in t, what you're looking at is some, is some exponential rate, and then the rate is controlled by this integral, and that's the fam famous formula for the transition, the click rate of uh, unreal detector. And you know that this can't quite be right, because it, you know, if you have a bunch of particles decaying, the, the each decay doesn't in typically affect the other ones that haven't decayed yet, unless you look at things like the Zeno effect and th where we're the back reaction. For this qubit system, it can't work like that. It can't be that you have some linear uh, transition that's always linear, because you're going to eventually start, unitarity is going to force you to saturate the upper state, and you're going to get driven down again. So this story has to be failing at late times. Uh, this is the right answer for the rate with which you start to leave the ground state in early times, but it's the thing which does not resum late times. And I'll show you uh, the late time story, and you'll see, see this is a subset of it uh, when we get further down the road. All right, so, so now, so what's the idea? So the thought, the thought that goes into being able to do a later time thing, yeah. Yeah. Time, you the right, you're going to come down. Right, and that's exactly, so that's what Shaman and company are missing. But what I'm going to tell you now, we'll put that back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, so, so what's the, what are the steps you do to get the, uh, you know, the goal was to set up some differential equation for the, uh, the density matrix, which didn't make reference to time. And so, you, and then you'd like to integrate it over some period. So what's, how do you get that differential equation from the Liouville equation? The problem with the Liouville equation is that uh, you, 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 you've got the rate of change of what you want, the reduced density matrix, but you've got the trace of some mess, which is not coming to you as a function of the, of the reduced density matrix. But that you can solve once and for all, and that's what uh, Nakajima and Zwanzig, I think, did. So the, the basic observation is that time evolution is linear. It's a linear process. And projection onto the reduced density matrix is also a linear process. So you can solve once and for all how the, the projected uh, density matrix evolves. The reduced density matrix evolves as a function of itself. So formally, what you do is Kind of, uh, you acknowledge that the evolution equations is this linear thing, where curly L is the Liouville operator. And now we'll define a projection uh, operator which uh, takes, takes any operator and it uh, basically traces out the, in sector B, the field sector, and then uh, it gives you back the vacuum in sector B. And so that has the property that if I apply it to the density matrix, I get the vacuum plus the reduced density matrix as a function of time. That's the thing I want to follow. And it has a property that if I square it, I get itself back, so it's a projection operator. And so one minus it is also a projection operator. And so what you just do is you, you apply that P and Q to the Liouville equation, and then you, uh, you, know, you sandwich P and Q on both sides. And so this gives you a coupled set of linear evolution equations for the thing you want and the rest. And what you do is, since it's linear, is you solve for the rest as an integral over these things, plug it back in, and you get an equation involving only what you want. And that's the nakajima Zwanzig equation. So, if I do that exercise and I apply it to, in, in general, it's, it, it's an explicit formula, but it, there's a, in perturbation theory, it's concrete. If I take an interaction of this form, do that algorithm, then this is what you find, is you have a rate of change, which is the first term is what we had before. But now this is the second order thing looks similar to what we had before, but it has an integral. It's got a convolution between rho and the interaction Hamiltonian. And that's because we kind of took this that was in the field and we put it back in, we evolved it forward. And so this whole, evolution of rho, it, it remembers the history of how it's been interacting with the, with the, with the environment uh, for some period of time, and the period of time will be controlled by the, the, the times over which that autocorrelation auto function of the interaction with itself has uh, got some support. So, so far not, no progress, because the progress was that you've, you've got an equation of only the variable you want, but you've made it an integral equation, which is uh, no, no easier to solve than the original one was. So then the next thing is to find the approximation that allow you to solve it. And that's the, uh, uh, here, here all I'm doing is I'm just it to the qubit system. So it's the same formula as last time, but now explicitly involving the qubit system. The reason I want to show you this is that uh, you can now see that if we had been Candelas and Shama, we would have had this, but we would not have had this, this, or this. And that's because um, the initial condition used, the, the, in this, in the, I'm using row one, two. One and two are labeling the two states of the qubit. Two is the vacuum. So I was originally taking the vacuum to, to pure vacuum state. So I'm taking row one, two at an initial time and row one, one initial time to be zero. And so if the logic was that the difference between row and its initial value was order b, then 
the logic of uh, Candelis and uh, Shama was that we have to throw these things away because these uh, rows are all are all going to higher order in G, and so and that's not that's not false. Okay, good. Um, but the the way you build in the physics of the transitions going down and up and capturing late times is that you need to keep, keep these extra terms. This memory is actually telling you something, and it's not strictly perturbative, and that's because perturbation theory is wrong at late times, and this is the writer answer we're going to get to. And so the question will be, what controls the approximation that we're going to do? Second thing to notice is that uh, row 1, 1 just evolves the function of row 1, 1, and row 1, 2 is the function of row 1, 2. They don't talk to each other, so there's two time scales in the problem. They're evolving independently, uh, which is a separate thing. Come in later. So now, the thought is that if it's true that you have a hierarchy of scales, the effective field theory part will be now the hierarchy of scales. So if it's true that this Whiteman function has some support over some region of time, and you're only interested in late time, so you're only interested in how this thing evolves on scales that are slow compared to that, that's where the, that, that's where the, uh, the approximation uh, leads you to a useful equation for late times. And then what will happen basically is that if this is a sharply peaked function, you can tailor expand this convolution integral around uh, argument equals tau. You can do it in powers of s. And what you're doing is you're doing a series in the scale of time that you're interested in looking at divided by the scale that's in the Whiteman function in the, in the environment you're interacting with. And so uh, if we go through that exercise, just do the Taylor expand expansion. I um, uh, just told you that. There's a separate thing. I, I, uh, I, there's a fact. If you, so for aficionados, there's what's called the rotating phase uh, pro, or the rap, uh, rotating wave approximation, you have to do two things. The, the Taylor expansion I told you is part of the story, but it's also true that if it's true that there's a, the frequency I have for this qubit could, be, could have been large compared to the time frame which I'm calling long, and this still can work I even if that frequency is large, but I have to make sure that I coarse grain those fast frequency pieces in the interaction because that's spurious physics at late time, and so uh, there's, just, there's, there's two things, strictly speaking, that need to be done to go from this equation to the next one I'm going to show you. But the main one, if you think of Omega being small, it's really this main one that this, this Taylor expansion I'm going to do uh, gives you a simple system. And it gives you a simple system because now it's Markovian. Now, because I could pull row outside of the integral, the evolution at, to later times only cares about where you started and how you get there. And so, uh, and once it's Markovian, things are much simpler. These coefficients, R, delta, and C, are, uh, R I gave you on the re earlier slide. C and delta are just, uh, again, real parts of the Whiteman function weighted by cosine and sine. Remember that R was, I think, just weighted by e to the i omega t, so hey, omega tau, so they're, they're just, just simple things built from the Whiteman function. Now, there's this, this is, the, the claim is that this is the equation that will describe late time behavior, the leading order in g squared t. Subdominant in, you know, so, but it won't be things like g to the fourth t. So this is telling you what the late time behavior is, so let's go through it. That's the Shama result. And so if you thought that these things were all order G, you would have gotten that, uh, that result. But that's the thing that's going to fail at late times. Uh, at late times, it happens that uh, you might expect it's kind of a first order set of equations. You might think it's going to asymptote to some constant at late times. That is what happens. If you have a mess condition for the uh, Whiteman function, where there's, it's, uh, there's, it's invariant under a shift of imaginary time, essentially, then you know that this thing you're going to is a thermal state. This temperature is given by 1 over this thing you're shifting by. All the examples I'm going to give you have that property, so we know what we're approaching at late times. The question is how fast are you approaching it? That's what these equations are telling you. This is telling you the rate with which the diagonal element is approaching this particular thermal balance. And then uh, this is telling you the rate with which the off-diagonal terms are zero, and they needn't be the same. So there's a, a sense there's a de decoherence time and a thermalization time that are separate. I put them in quotes because it's not really the true that one of them is thermalization, one's decoherence. They're kind of there's two time scales that are both appearing in those two time scales. And uh, you're also getting organization of your frequency, which is something you expected to get anyway. All right. So in the sitter space, uh, just as a concrete example, so far what I told you would have applied to any space time. But in the space, this is what the Whiteman function is. So you know it is a explicit, explicit function of time. New here is the usual thing that involves the mass. And, I, and I've included uh, potential non-minimal coupling to the scalar to the scalar field. In the conformal case, that boils down to this. And this is a useful way to look at it because it shows you that you're, you've got a fall off which is exponential in, in, uh, in, in, in time along the world line. And it's uh, the scale of that exponential is set by h. 
it satisfies this KMS condition, uh, and so we know that there's in that previous story there's going to be a thermal thing that's going to go to the the temperature that you expect in the, the sitter bath, and so but it's going to happen on time scale by construction long compared to H inverse, so the Hubble time. Don't have to show it to me. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm just basically done here. So if you kind of go through the exercise, this is what the time scales turn out to be. They depend parametrically on the various things in your problem. But they're divided by g squared, and it's just the smallness of g is what's making these things uh, self-consistent, that the time scales you're looking at are long compared to the Hubble time. In the sitter space, there's the extra thing that if the mass of the scalar had been small, there's this critical slowing down phenomenon that happens that that Boltzmann function gets a much more broader uh, support because it's supported on a scale h over m an h inverse, but that's kind of a, the rest of the story goes through equally well. And in the, in the late time limit, it's always Markovian. And that Markovian answer can now be integrated uh, which is what I've done when I quoted you time, those time scales for the exponential decay towards the thermal bath. So, what's the punchline? The punchline is that uh, I think it's true, and I think many people think it's true, that uh, you know, the, the things like infrared and secular problems in cosmology and things like, uh, and potentially things like uh, late time and information loss in, in uh, black holes is pointing to, they smell like there's some sort of a problem with our calculational tools. Uh, at late times. And I'm arguing that there is a problem with our calculational tools at late times. There's a generic problem at late times doing perturbation theory. Uh, and, and the only people that don't know that are particle physicists because we normally have wave packets. They interact, they turn off, and there's no late times. So, but if you have an environment that just sits there and you interact with it for a long time, it's generic that there's a problem. But there's also a lot of tools for doing the resummation of that late time behavior, which we should be using. And it doesn't mean that, that using them is going to solve the information loss problem. It just means that we'll have a more confidence in the reliability of our inference of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the inferences we're drawing at times, given that we're always making perturbative inferences. Uh, we're at work on the black hole case is in progress. A short version of where it's going, I think, is that as all this stuff happens, there are secular growth things that are happening in black hole backgrounds, although there's fewer explicit calculations of that, but you can kind of construct them if you want to. Uh, but they, they seem to be resummable, and they basically, the resummation in the case of a scalar field of, with a lambda phi, the fourth interaction, amounts to shifting its mass. And so what happens is that correlation functions, they do die with time. So things become decohered with time, as you might expect from the firewall kind of arguments. But they, they happen slower than you're used to. And the reason that perturbation theory fails is that, uh, is that the correlation functions all fall something like that. But the zeroth order unperturbed correlation functions all drop like a rock. And so if you're perturbing around this, it looks like you're getting, doing a worse and worse job. And so the secular growth that happens in these black hole examples are really just a sign that, that you're perturbing around the wrong thing. And resumming them uh, with the mass still gives you things that are falling in time, but with a parametrically different dependence on uh, things like the coupling. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Questions? So, uh, do you have a, like a, a practical uh, results? So, uh, what is the the, the idea uh, at the end of all, of all this? Is, for instance, uh, a detector free falling in the sitter would uh, see the sitter temperature? I guess. Yeah, if you wait long enough, it'll it'll thermalize. But I think that people would have believed that anyway. Yes. And, but the time with which you get there is not set by the Shama Candela's time. That's the. So for the, for the qubit, that, that would be the message. And, and, but but and if, uh, what I didn't talk about was that if, if that scalar had a self-interaction, like a lambda phi the fourth, the rate with which you thermalize changes again in a way which uh, depends on lambda, but in a non, it depends on the square root of lambda. So it's one of these, these it's like hard thermal loops. It's a case where there's a class of graphs that you had to sum up in order to uh, properly capture the late time limit. And they give you a non-analytic uh, behavior in the coupling the constant. Loop expansion parameter is the dimension. Sorry? The loop expansion parameter yeah, it's, 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 because these are all thermal in the end of the day, all the things you expect for therm thermality happen. And the, the puzzle is the Rindler case, because you would think that that's actually a Minkowski vacuum. How can you get something thermal there? Turns out that also works. Mm -hmm. So it's a. I think uh, they're not, yeah, there were some words. Uh, yeah, but the lambda photo I don't think it's uh, thermal in this. That is a, the way it's, not a tri it's not the same as lambda photo the in the. A finite temperature. The wave function is a is not a mass term. What is emerging? It's not a summation of trivial diagrams because uh, the wave function, as we showed the other day, is e to the minus lambda phi to the fourth. This is the sitter space you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah. What, yeah what I was talking about 
I thought you were talking about. No, I, was, I, was, I meant the black hole uh, Windward case when I said thermal. Okay, thing. that we didn't study. But the thermal in the sitter is not. Of course, uh, in the study patch is thermal, but uh, other places which are actually what we care about, that is in FRW slicing, uh, very far distances, is a completely, completely non thermal. I don't know. It's e to the minus lambda factor to the fourth, the wave function. So it's not Gaussian. Uh, what's not Gaussian? Uh, the wave function is competing on Gaussian, yes. it's not just oh, yeah. the mass. Right, right. If, if it, it was a mass, it would be the wave function would be Gaussian right. with the mass of square root of lambda. It's not at all. I mean, it's a quartic uh, function. It's no, that's true. But the statement about mass in the sitter space, there is a statement about mass in the sitter space that if you're interested in summing up uh, all orders in, in uh, m over h times a log of time, then that piece of the, 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 t the, the, the endpoint functions is being captured by a shift in the mass. That's the only statement. It's not the statement is not that the state you're in is really a Gaussian state. Because you know, it is true that once you turn on interaction, then you do have the, you know, the, the wave function is not Gaussian. And it, uh, but there's a specific late time statement about uh, correlation functions. So a subset of, a subset of, the, of, the, of, the, of the whole graph. We can talk about it if you like. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, just a confusion. So for the sitter, for, so for human, the step time, um, for a given the sitter uh, solution, what is the time where perturbation theory fails? You know, do you have some, is there some, some um, can you estimate? So for example, for a black hole, we know that if you wait for the Boltzmann time, you know, there are all these recurrence times which happen for yeah. the black hole. And you know, you can, you can, you can find there's a time when you, when you know that, you know, to preserve quantum unitarity, information has to come out. You, you, something has to be happening. Right. And perturbation theory breaks down. You don't have the same exponential decays you get at early times, but you know, there's something happening. You, there's like this, uh, new um, so essentially w whatever you um, so, so there's a time after the after which this breakdown appeared uh, can you see this time for the sitter you know is there not some number you know some e to the power of the, the sitter entropy or into the power of the distal entropy squared or you know some it's not so universal as that the, the general statement is that if you it depends on the interactions you're, you're perturbing in because because the generic thing is that if you if you you know you're, you've got some interaction h T and then you're, it, the problems are happening when T is of the order of one over H. So if you're if you've got some parametrically small coupling, it's of order one over that. Now if it's true that your interactions are gravitational strength, so they're coming in like the you know the in the Schwarzschild case the mass of the whole divided by the Planck mass, then for a specific power of that that turns into something like the page time. But it's uh, but you know so it depends a little bit on what you what you think the coupling strength is. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> So you know there's like th this DSCFT uh, argument, that, you know, in the sitter we get, so there's a dual CFT. So in the dual CFT, you can also see that, you know, there's something happening, you know, you put the CFT in a box, and there's a central charge, and if you wait after a time, which is awarded the central charge, then, you know, something happens. Yeah. But the same as in the, can you say anything like that here? I mean, you know, can you argue that, you know, for example, the theories you have fit into the SCFT or don't, or, you know, would they have some, uh, because, you know, for example, if you take some theory which, let's, uh, let's say, has a DSCFT dual, then there's a time, there's a prediction from the dual CFT that, you know, after a time which is the central charge times whatever size of whatever box you have, then, you know, you'll have something happening. Can you see some, I mean? Yeah, I think there probably is a connection, but I can't tell you what it is. I, we haven't done the, the, the anti sitter case in detail. I suspect No, the sitter, the sitter. So oh, sorry, DS I'll say, I'll say it again. Uh, there's a correspondence called the sitter CFT by Strom and Yes, oh, okay. So no, the DS, which uh, has actually has been established by, for some Vasiliev gravities. Right. So, you know, there are some theories where you can actually have, have a the sitter conformal free theory correspondence. Right. And there, you know, for example, there's a CFT dual. And you know that when you have a CFT dual, uh, when the CFT is in a box, there's something funny happening at time which is the central charge times ha times the, times the, the, si the size of, of the box. For yeah. example, this is the, this is the time where you, ex you expect non-thermal behavior to happen. So you know, here for example, it would be it would be you know, it would be some time controlled. So I, I think there's a calculation to be. So done my answer is the same. I, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, maybe I don't even know what I'm talking about. But so, if the coupling is too. S is too is weaker than gravity then it means that the in this time i mean the the, the relevant time scale no, no, in in other words for a coupling to emerge from gravity so can you say something about coupling strength here <laughs> so no, yeah the short version is no <laughs> you know i suspect so the, the way the naive way i think about it is that is that you have couplings you dial but you always have gravity and that gravity will win if you make the other one too small, but I don't, the precise, no I don't think I have a robust statement, no. Okay, let's thank uh, Cliff again.
if it not if it's uh, I think I can just press uh, yeah. uh, This working? Okay, we have a uh, current in interbicler. We talk about. I don't remember. Let's see this.